Hello and welcome to your new summer job at the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The first words you hear in FNAF 2 are its greatest mystery. Summer job? Jeremy's check shows November 1987, and the US minimum wage shows we're not in Australia. The pool that might be water on camera 2 never evaporates between nights 1 and 7. No time travel is involved, and all our friendly animatronics already exist on night 1. FNAF 2 must be an unbroken work week in winter 1987. Could all the FNAF 2 calls be pre-recorded just like in FNAF 1? No, because the restaurant investigation progresses in real time after night 1, with Jeremy getting a reassigned to day shift after night 6 and vanishing before night 7. Phone Guy says Jeremy's birthday party is the last event scheduled at Freddy's, which is confirmed by the newspaper with Jeremy's overtime check. We're Gardo 2, following the single week of Gardo 1 shift, and the toy animatronics have been in use for a grand total of one week. Yet in that week, something happened that was so terrible that the first guard demanded to transfer without even telling Phone Guy why, then ran away, leaving Phone Guy to realize the horrible truth as the restaurant crumbled around him. The bite of 87 is never mentioned in FNAF 2, so what could Gardo 1 have seen? <laughs> I'm Blackfoot Ferret, and welcome to the second episode of FNAF Theory Shorts. This five video special recaps all my theories on the epic story of the Five Nights at Freddy's games, and reboots and replaces my earlier series, The Final Theory. I've learned so many things over the last year that I thought it best to start over again. Each video builds on the next, so if you want to know the dark secret of FNAF 1, check out the first, Soul Eating Special. Today's video seeks to solve all the child murders at Freddy's, as well as taking a stab at why they happened in the first place. And the key to solving the timeline before FNAF 1 is the Summer Paradox. So Fungi plays a tape that says it's summer when it's actually winter. It seems like a small detail, why is it so important? Because there's only one event in FNAF's lore that specifically happens in summer. The Missing Children Incident. The Dread MCI where the five children who later possessed Freddy and company died. The incident the FNAF 1 ghost posters seem to say began with two missing children on June 26th, ending with a total of five in the second poster. So how can the Night 1 tape say it's summer but still be relevant to Winter 1987? My theory is that Nights 2 through 6 do happen live in Winter 1987, but the Night 1 tape was actually recorded during the first opening of the FNAF 2 location in Summer 1983. And the circumstances surrounding Jeremy's first shift at the new and improved Freddy's were so similar to its grand reopening four years later in Winter that Phone Guy simply replayed the Night 1 tape again. Which means the Summer Paradox is not only the key to solving one massacre at Freddy's, but two, each one happening in Gardo 1 shift before Jeremy took over. Because this section of the lore is so tangled and complex, it's best if we go one step at a time. Let's start by reviewing the known kill events at Freddy's and their number of victims, because the victim number is vital to identifying which minigames are referenced during which events. The first murder happened outside the very first Freddy's, and going by Phone Guy's FNAF 1 comment about seeing the same songs for 20 years and never getting a bath, this was 20 years before FNAF 1. Using Game Theory's minimum wage calculation that FNAF 1 is in 1993, this places the earliest restaurant and the puppet's creation in 1973. To clarify, the 1973 diner was the first Freddy's, and not Fredbear's Family Diner, because we play as Freddy in the minigame, and the very same head spread is used later on in Give Gifts, Give Life. The Fred Bear and Spring Bonnie spring suits were designed as golden quote-unquote superior versions of the existing characters of Freddy and Bonnie, and were introduced in the new and improved Freddy's where FNAF 2 takes place, telling us that another Freddy's had to exist before it. At the original Freddy's of 1973, our first victim is seemingly stabbed by the Magenta Man, first referred to as the Pink Guy by the 8-Bit Gaming Channel, a phrase I adopted from my own two-villain theory video of the Color Brothers, which aired just before FNAF 4 came out. The puppet jump scare at the end of Take Cake to the Children links its creation to this child, as if the pink guy had somehow carried off the child's soul, leaving their still standing body behind. The second kill event happens in the minigame Foxy Go Go, that time when Pirates Cove is Foxy in it. The pink guy is no longer an outsider, but an insider, watching as Foxy gives two performances, then walks into a closed off room to the east of Pirates Cove, and discovers all five of the children he's been entertaining are now dead. Combined with Give Gifts, Give Life, this event seems to be the MCI itself, where Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Golden Freddy were reborn. The third kill event we know about happens during the Save Them minigame, at a time when Mangle has replaced Foxy at the renamed Kids Cove, which times and dates this is happening on Garda 1 shift the very week before Jeremy started his winter shift in FNAF 2. So how do you tell the MCI and Save Them massacres apart if they both have five victims? Because Save Them doesn't have five victims, it has six! A quick look at the Save Them map shows five bodies scattered far away from five huge blood spots, but a closer look reveals a sixth blood spot under the puppet's box, if you can get that far without being ambushed by the purple guy. And six victims make sense because we see the origin of six new characters in FNAF 2. Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie, Toy Chica, Balloon Boy, Mangle, and JJ. Don't forget Shy Balloon Girl. 
So each kill event in FNAF actually has a unique number of victims, which lets us identify which minigames correspond to which events just by looking at that number. The puppet comes from Take Cake back in 1973. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and Golden Freddy are the five victims of the MCI, and their deaths are shown in Foxy Go Go, while Give Gifts Give Life tells how the puppet placed the four remaining bodies into their suits, while Golden Freddy, now stuffed into Fredbear along with Shadow Freddy, cameos as the fifth ghost at the end. Events that must have happened at the first opening of the new and improved Freddy's in the summer of 1983. And Toy Freddy, Toy Bonnie, Toy Chica, Mangle, Balloon Boy, and JJ all came from the Save the Massacre during the second opening of the new improved Freddy's in Winter 1987, just before Jeremy Shift in FNAF 2. When you put the three events together, you get an apparently complete roster of all the child animatronic characters we encounter before FNAF 1. Now we need to establish that the new and improved Freddy's has been opened twice, and that both times it was the same location. FNAF 2 is only open for two weeks in Winter 1987, with Gardo 1 and Gardo 2, Jeremy, each working a week, with Gardo 3, Tempfritz Smith, working a single night on Day 7 after Jeremy's reassignment. The last day before the police investigation into the Save Them Massacre shuts down the restaurant for good. Yet the newspaper clipping with Jeremy's overtime check says the restaurant has been open for a few short weeks, a few being more than two. This very restaurant has been open before, that's why the opening screen for FNAF 2 heralds the grand reopening of a vintage pizzeria. And further evidence can be found in the details of the MCI, which we now know is referenced in Foxy Gogo. -Go. The FNAF 1 ghost poster describing the MCI claims five children were lured by a man specifically dressed as a cartoon mascot, luring them into a back room. If this back room had cameras in it, as most rooms at Freddy's do, the fate of the five children wouldn't have been a mystery. Police could have played the tapes and seen exactly what happened to them. Instead, the bodies were never found. The back room wasn't just any room, it was the secret room with the location, which Phone Guy says is never on camera. So we're looking for a location that has a secret room located east of Pirate's Cove. This immediately knocks out the FNAF 1 building, because its version of Pirate's Cove is on the west wall of its huge central dining hall, both too large and too exposed for this deed. We know firsthand there's a camera there. But in the second opening of FNAF 2's location, Pirate's Cove was converted to Kid's Cove, where Mangle resides. The Save of the Map has a blank spot on the grid right to the east of Kid's Cove, a suspicious square of blackness that's also right next to the Puppets Box. If you rewound time to the first opening when Foxy ran Pirate's Cove, the events pictured in Foxy Gogo -Go could easily be happening here. A popular theory says the purple guy killed the MCI kids by luring them to the back room using the Spring Bonnie suit. But there's no sign of Spring Bonnie in these minigames, with good reason. The FNAF 1 5 victim poster said the suspect was dressed as a cartoon mascot, quote unquote. Not just a Freddy's character, but one that actually appeared in the Fazbear Entertainment promotional cartoon Fredbear and Friends. And the FNAF 4 cartoon Easter egg shows Fredbear hanging out with Foxy, Bonnie playing guitar, Chica offering cupcakes, and Freddy getting the full face hero shot as lead singer character. As strange as it might seem, Spring Bonnie, Fredbear's supposed right hand animatronic, never appears in the cartoon, and cannot be the suit used to lure the MCI kids. This checks out because Spring Bonnie never appears in Foxy Go Go either, with Foxy, who was in the cartoon, acting as a luring suit during the MCI, and looking as surprised as everyone else when the kids suddenly turned up dead. Fredbear and Friends also are to 1983, and while the crying child of FNAF 4 could be watching this 80s show in reruns any time afterwards, the cartoon establishes Fredbear was active in 1983. Fungi says Fredbear's family diner has been closed for years as of winter 1987, but it must have been opened alongside its sister location, the new and improved Freddy's of summer 1983. As I mentioned in part one, Golden Freddy is the phantom animatronic of a victim who died and was stuffed inside the Fredbear spring suit. So while Spring Bonnie wasn't on hand for the MCI, Fredbear must have been there at the time the five children were stuffed. We also learn a very interesting bit of lore in FNAF 3, that the MCI, the site of the multiple simultaneous spring log failures, happened at the sister location. First, let me clear up a popular belief about why this message refers to several suits failing at once rather than several spring locks failing on a single suit. There is no such thing as a single spring lock failure. The Silver Eyes shows us how the concussive force of a single spring lock giving out also sets off other spring locks around it, like dominoes or firecrackers, starting a chain reaction that only ends after all spring locks have failed. Just like Night 4 of Sister Location, you can't afford to let even one spring lock fail without dying. Next, Phone Guy, or whoever might be mimicking his voice, makes it sound like spring lock failure is a routine thing at Freddy's. Their dispassionate advice for someone bleeding to death from such a failure is to quickly run to the secret room so they can die without grossing out the customers, the only time when employees are actually allowed into that room. A single spring lock failure death has no impact upon Phasma Entertainment's policies. In fact, 
as an evil, literally soul-sucking corporation, discreet solo failures actually help further the true objectives of the company, which are far more ambitious and sinister than selling stale pizza. Only a truly large and shocking incident, powerful enough to pop the bubble of plausible deniability the company has wrapped itself in, and threaten the entire organization with a police investigation that could expose all of its horrors, would get Fazbear Entertainment's management to halt the use of its soul ceiling spring suits for even a little while. Because while there may be a relatively small chance of any given spring suit failing on any given day, the only statistical possibility for several suits all failing at exactly the same instant is murder. Someone disengineered the deaths of an entire room full of people. Phone Guy never said the multiple failures happened to employees. Two deaths would be a couple. Several deaths is a higher number, much closer to the five victims of the MCI. The multiple spring suit incident is a direct reference to the MCI, and its aftermath shown in Give Gifts, Give Life, where the puppet stuffs the MCI victims into the animatronic spring suits to give their souls a second chance at life. I have one more popular thought to address. The belief that only two spring suits exist and were all that ever existed. Phone Guy states in the FNAF 3 Night 2 call that right now we have two special suits, before explaining the basics of spring suit operation. These two special suits are the famous golden suits Spring Bonnie and Spring Freddy, aka Fredbear, but the right now suggests more suits followed after them. In fact, the golden suits weren't even the first spring suits to exist. They were simply the first two new ones at the new and improved Freddy's in summer 1983, the first two specially designed for Fazbear Entertainment's singular new strategy. In the FNAF 2 Night 2 call, Fungi refers to the withered animatronics, the original horrid smelling MCI suits that are now in disrepair and being cannibalized for parts for the toys, as being from the previous location. Not only does this cement the Night 2 phone call as happening in winter 1987, it also tells us that, since summer 1983 was not a different location, but the first opening of the same building as FNAF 2, the previous location is actually the original 1973 Freddy's where the puppet was born. This makes sense because the first thing we see in Take Cake to the Children is a human performing in the original brown Freddy spring suit. This cannot be an autonomous animatronic, since the FNAF 2 Night 1 call lists the company allowing the animatronics to walk around during the day as one of the improvements made to the new and improved Freddy's versus the old restaurant. The original owners in 1973 did not let their robots walk about during the day. The Freddy in this minigame throwing a birthday party for young children has to be a human performer because it's moving about during business hours. And the very same pixelated head used by this performer appears years later in Give Gifts as the head placed on the Freddy MCI victim. We see a similar situation in Foxy Go Go, where Foxy entertains the MCI kids before they die. The FNAF 1 poster says the suspect who was convicted of the disappearances was caught on camera luring the kids in a cartoon mascot suit. The Foxy in this minigame can't be MCI Foxy because the MCI kids haven't been stuffed yet. The human inside this Foxy suit was Gardo 1, the one convicted of luring the MCI children. And he wasn't the pink guy who watched Foxy enter the secret room. While well, Phone Guy admits that Fazbear Entertainment has heavily modified the suits at the time when Gardo 2's, Jeremy's, shift began in 1983, the Withered Animatronics, the very ones whose odor closed the restaurant in 83, all originally came from the first Freddy's in 73. The idea that the original management of the first Freddy's didn't allow the robots to walk about during the day raises an incredible possibility. Could Freddy and his friends have actually been alive and sentient before the MCI, when they absorbed the children's souls? But this is too much for today. Let's save it for the next episode. I apologize for taking so many side trips today, but the timeline here is very complex, and you can't see how all the pieces fit into place until all the pieces have been revealed. We're here to solve the murders today, and need to get back to them. So far we've established that multiple spring suits exist, and that the incident where several of them all failed at once was the MCI itself. That the puppet put the bodies of four of the five MCI victims into spring suits as a way of giving their souls new life as animatronics, and that the fifth child, a boy named Michael in the novel, was stuffed into Fredbear and became Golden Freddy after Shadow Freddy attempted to eat him. So how can we be sure that the 1983 new and improved Freddy's is a dreaded sister location? A sister location suggests two locations are open at once, and since Fredbear is active in summer 1983 as an animatronic and cartoon character, it stands to reason that Fredbear's family diner is open then as well. Fredbear's wasn't the restaurant in 1973 and was closed in winter in 87, so summer 83 was definitely when it was open. The FNAF 3 Night 4 call says the multiple Springlock failures happened at the sister location. Fredbear's family diner is always pictured as having two animatronics, Spring Bonnie and Fredbear, so the incident must have happened at Freddy's instead of Fredbear's because only Freddy's had enough suits on hand for the incident. This call must be coming from someone in Fredbear's family diner, sounding very much like they're the manager there, talking about the other restaurant. As another side note, Fun Guy said he wasn't the owner of Fredbear's, yet this call shows someone with his exact voice recording a message from Fredbear's with a manager attitude that talks down to the listener. Could someone be pulling an Ennard and mimicking Phone Guy's voice? But enough sidetracking, we've got murders to solve and it's time we got back to the summer paradox. 
The idea I put forward earlier was that the FNAF 2 Night 1 call was pre-recorded in Summer 83 while still being aimed at Jeremy, while the other FNAF 2 calls happened in real time in Winter 87, and it's time to prove that. Let's break down the clues in each of the FNAF 2 calls. Night 1 is Phone Guy insisting that the new Freddy's is better than the old one, listing all the reasons and upgrades, including the facial recognition system that can identify criminals and especially convicts. Phone Guy says you are Guard 02 at the location after Guard 01 requested a transfer to day shift after his week because some of the animatronics tried to attack his office. The puppet is already active. Phone Guy says there's a music box by the prize counter in the prize corner designed to keep it at bay, constantly playing the song My Grandfather's Clock. The Freddy head is listed as a defense against the other animatronics. So at the time of Night 1's call, the puppet is active and the MCI has already happened since multiple animatronics attempted to attack Gardo 1's office during the week. There is no mention of the toy animatronics or the withered animatronics in Night 1. Night 2 first mentions the withered animatronics and how they're from the previous location. Phone Guy mentions they started to retrofit the withereds with newer technology, but their ugliness and smell made the company abandon the idea and develop the toys instead, using parts from the withereds. He seems to like Foxy while warning you to use the flashlight against him, and how the Freddy head won't work on Foxy since he's always been twitchy. Phone Guy says your flashlight should temporarily stun any animatronic, old or new. He also says he never liked the puppet because it was always thinking and could go anywhere. So Night 2 established the withered animatronics as the MCI animatronics from the smell, and that the toys contained parts from the withereds and inherited their quirks. The puppet is still there even though Phone Guy doesn't like it. This call must be from Winter 87. Night 3's call is Phone Guy asserting that Foxy was always his favorite, and seems to lament the company's decision to remake Foxy and establish Kids Cove. He describes how Mangle, who he calls Foxy, was torn apart by kids after every shift. Phone Guy also says rumors have begun to circulate about the restaurant, but since Guard 01, who's on watch from opening to close, has reported nothing wrong, Phone Guy dismisses the rumors. In Night 4's call, Phone Guy mentions there's an investigation going on, saying it's just a precaution and that sometimes incidents happen. He asks you not to make eye contact with the animatronics since someone might have tampered with their facial recognition, and that while the robots treat the kids just fine, they just stare at adults and are downright hostile to the staff. On Night 5, the building is on lockdown, with nobody being allowed in or out. Worse still, Gardo 01 has fled the building or gone into hiding without giving a reason, with Phone Guy worldly remarking that the day shift position is now available after he left. Phone Guy also mentions trying to contact the original owner of Fredbear's, but isn't optimistic since Fredbear's has been closed for years. The owner of Fredbear's wasn't Phone Guy. On night 6, things get dark. Phone Guy is surprised to see Jeremy at all, although with the building on lockdown he shouldn't be. The building is now officially closed down, at least for a while. Someone used one of the suits. We had a spare in the back, a yellow one. Someone used it! Now none of them are acting right! Phone Guy finally realized the Save Them Massacre has happened, an entire week after the fact, and that someone in one of the golden suits committed the act. In spite of the building being officially closed due to the spectacularly brutal murders of six people by a Hamasdale Terminator-class robot suit, Phone Guy informs Jeremy that he's being assigned to cover a birthday party on the day shift the following day. He should wear his uniform, which the robots will love, and stay as close to them as possible. Phone Guy says he'll take the night shift himself when the restaurant reopens. Phone Guy says he'll take the night shift because he knows Jeremy isn't coming back. The Bite of 87 is never referenced anywhere in FNAF 2. The restaurant closes because of the ongoing investigation into the Save Them Massacre, and was slated to close at the end of the week regardless of whatever happened on the day shift of Day 7. Yet FNAF 2 is only open for two weeks in Winter 87, and the dreaded Bite of 87 must happen during that time. Phone Guy survives until the construction of FNAF 1. He wasn't bitten. Purple Guy survives until the destruction of FNAF 1. He wasn't bitten either. And the animatronics would never have bitten a kid or a parent. They were only hostile toward the staff of Freddy's. Fritz Smith, Guard 03 in Winter 87, is our character on Night 7, the last day the new and improved Freddy's is operating. Because earlier that day, Jeremy Fitzgerald became the Bite of 87 victim. We will learn who caused the Bite of 87 before the end of this video, but we need to stay focused when we turn to the Night 1 phone call. The Summer Paradox is the key to solving the pre-FNAF 1 story because it establishes a similarity between events in two different places in time. That the circumstances between Jeremy's first shift in Summer 83 and his second shift in Winter 87 were so similar that Phone Guy simply replayed the first Summer 83 tape again, thinking one was as good as the other, and seeing no need for additional effort. In both 83 and 87, Jeremy is Guard 02. In both 83 and 87, Jeremy starts because Guard 01 requests the day transfer. In both times, Guard 01 requests this shift because animatronics have begun to attack him at night. Because in both 87 and 83, a massacre has occurred during Guard 01's week, leading to animatronics becoming possessed. And not only is Jeremy the second night guard in both these weeks that parallel each other in time, but Guard 01, who was on hand when both the MCI and Save the Massacres happened, was the same person as well. 
Fungi is part of the management of the building. He refers to the employees in third person, as a group separate from his own, and one he can pass down edicts to, such as forbidding them from entering the secret room if they're not dying, or sealing said room without giving them notice even if they have possessions inside. And yet, despite the lack of respect he shows in dealing with his underlings, Fungai actually grants Gardo One's request for a transfer to day shift not once, but twice. And Fungai laments over Foxy's reduced status in Kid's Cove since Foxy is his favorite character, as if there is some higher authority at Freddy's than even his own making policy decisions. The facial recognition systems of the robots are described in Night One, so these were in play even in 1983, and were likely just what they said they were, security measures designed to identify and catch convicts. Since there were no convicts working at Freddy's in 1983, this wasn't an issue for the staff. However, the ghost posters in FNAF 1 announced something very different from the novel, that the suspect charged with luring the MCI kids to the back room actually was convicted despite the bodies never being found. At this point in time, this person would show up on a criminal database, and should they try to work at Freddy's again, the animatronics would detect them. On Night 4 of FNAF 2 in Winter 87, Phone Guy theorizes that someone tampered with the robot's facial recognition systems. Such a person would not only have to be an insider at Freddy's, but they'd have to have a good deal of technical know-how, like the single technician Freddy's has on staff, and they would also have to have a reason for the tampering. So Gardo 1 was an important figure at Freddy's who witnessed both massacres on both weeks before Jeremy's shift each year, was convicted of luring the MCI kids into the back room in 83, and was the resident technician at Freddy's. Who is this person? We get the answer in a rare event during the Save Them minigame, that in 83, Gardo 1 was William Afton, the mysterious purple guy. To quickly reference both my earlier video of the Color Brothers and the novel The Silver Eyes, Freddy's is run by a two-man team, including resident technician William Afton, who uses the fake name Dave Miller in the book, and Henry, Charlie and Sammy's dark-eyed father, whose last name is never given. Henry is pictured in photographs wearing the Fredbear suit, while William's suit of choice in the novel is Spring Bonnie. William is marked as the purple guy in the novel by his naturally tall and thin forward hunched frame, and the weight loss he experiences between his financially shrewd Santa Claus phase and the living skeleton Charlie and company encounter years later. This weight loss is mirrored in the games between the purple guy Easter egg in FNAF 4 and purple guy Save Them Sprite in FNAF 2. Henry is twice described as being pink in the novel, looking pink and sweaty in a photo after taking off the Fredbear helmet, and the off-salmon color that Charlie swore was pink in her childhood filing cabinet in his office. His dark eyes in the family photos also invoke the black eye sockets of the Magenta Man, Sprite in FNAF 2, nicknamed the Pink Guy, even if he has nothing to do with Filthy Frank. William is the purple guy, and Henry is the Pink Guy, aka the Magenta Man, the two sprites we see in FNAF 2. Purple Guy is tall and skillfully thin, with an oval face and a long, forward-bent, giraffe-like neck, who sometimes wears a badge or carries a spring crank tool for resetting spring suits or demolishing them. He has a set of blazing white eyes, almost like an animatronic. Pink Guy is shorter, stockier, and square-edged. He has no neck and carries no implements, and has a set of pure black eye sockets. These sprites belong to two different men, and while Purple Guy loses weight from 83 to 87, Pink Guy looks exactly the same from 73 to 83. These are two different characters entirely, which is clearly stated in the novel. I called them the Color Brothers back in July 2015, two days before FNAF 4's sudden launch, because the two men must share some powerful bond to continue working together even after so many terrible things have happened. William got convicted for his role in luring the MCI kids, and still applied to work at the very same job at Freddy's four years later. And, amazingly, Henry, phone guy, let him do it! While the two might not literally be brothers, they must be family of some kind to work together and trust each other after so much has gone wrong. William's penchant for fake names and tech know-how as the single technician at Freddy's also link him to two other famous aliases, Temp Fritz Smith and the infamous Mike Schmidt. Both Fritz Smith and Mike Schmidt share the same Anglo-German pattern of two common names spliced together, and Smith and Schmidt are literally the same name in each language. Although Fritz and Smith are both common names, their combination together is very rare since Fritz is a derogatory name English soldiers called German soldiers in World War II. It's very unlikely that the English Smith family would call their own son Fritz. Fritz and Mike, an ex Benedict and sister location, share an ability. They're all technicians, and are the only characters in the entire FNAF series with the ability to manually adjust the animatronic settings to allow for a custom night, which is why we don't get custom nights in FNAF 3 and 4. How does a technician manually adjust the settings of a ghost like Golden Freddy in FNAF 2? Because GF was stuffed into the Fredbear suit just like Shadow Freddy was, and Fredbear, complete with intact endoskeleton, is in the building in FNAF 2. Phone Guy tells us there is only one technician at Freddy's, and it's highly unlikely a temp quickly hired off the street at minimum wage, but have such detailed esoteric knowledge about the workings of animatronics. Fritz Smith and Mike Schmidt are the FNAF 1 through 5 aliases of William Afton, who has actually worked with Henry slash Phone Guy at three different times in record, and perhaps even more. So, Gardo 1 is Purple Guy, and we have two confirmed cases where a total of 11 kids died while he was around. Is William a serial killer? Is this an open and shut case? 
First, I need to restate that while the Silver Eyes, Sister Location, and FNAF World are parallel continuities that I relate to and can offer us clues and insight into the mysteries of the main FNAF 1 through 4 story, details within each universe may be changed or even entirely flipped. To invoke a term used in comics, each is an alternate universe like Earth 2. A hero in one world might be a villain in the next, and the different outcome of a single decision could radically change the story. In FNAF 1 through 4, the first location is Freddy's. In the Silver Eyes, it's Fredbear's. The Silver Eyes is set in Hurricane Utah, while FNAF 1 through 4 is set in Niagara Falls, New York, if you happen to see the video and read a confirmed post of my discovery earlier. In the book, Golden Freddy is a young boy named Michael that was stuffed into Fredbear, while in Sister Location, Golden Freddy has somehow kept his name while being stuffed into Spring Bonnie's spring trap instead. In the book, William Afton is the evil business guy on the team, and kills Sammy, the first victim on record. In the games, Henry claims the first victim, who wasn't Sammy, and takes the role of Phone Guy, the beloved Two-Face spokesperson for evil businesses everywhere. In the book, William delights in the rush of power he gets in crushing children inside animatronic spring suits and adding them to his robot family. In Sister Location, in the Earth-1 version of the timeline, William is a hero who travels to a dark place to rescue a young girl and her family, enduring many trials along the way. Who, then, is the William Afton of FNAF 1 through 4? Is he guilty, innocent, or somewhere in between? Let's find out. First, we can clear William of the puppet's death. The pink guy, Henry, performed this act back in 1973. Pink Eye was outside the restaurant in 73, but is incited in 83, an outsider that became an insider. This reflects the puppet stabbing incident that caused the original 73 Freddy's to close and get bought out and reopened by Fazbear Entertainment. Henry essentially staged a buyout of the family company after engineering its fall. The puppet floats right past Purple Guy during the Save the Minigame, and neither character attacks the other. Phone Guy might not like the puppet, but when it comes to Purple Guy, they seem to be cool. In a similar way, we established that Purple Guy was the person piloting Foxy during the Foxy Go Go minigame, who was then convicted of luring the MCI kids and had to tamper with the robot's facial recognition so they wouldn't detect him. The minigame shows us that the MCI kids were dead before William slash Foxy entered the room, so even though he was convicted for the deed, he didn't actually kill the kids. We see Henry, the pink guy, watching in the background as Foxy makes his fateful third run. Can we blame Henry for these murders too? This time? No. If Henry slash pink guy slash phone guy was the top-notch mad scientist I described in The Color Brothers, harvesting the five children would have gone off like a well-oiled machine. The animatronics, stuffed with the flesh of their victims as the suits slowly absorbed their souls into the metal, would have been quickly retired to the afternoon box facility below and replaced by a lineup of backup suits that were already ready to go in a seamless transition. Instead, the company panics after the MCI and are forced to actually use the stuffed robots in the stage as people scramble to find temporary costumes while another set of replacement suits are being made. If the goal of the company at this time was stuffing the children, this is a huge logistical oversight that ultimately led to the health issues mentioned in the posters and the 1983 closing of the restaurant. William didn't kill the five kids, and Henry wasn't prepared for them to be stuffed. Neither one was the MCI murderer in FNAF 1 through 4, and Jeremy started the week after. He wasn't the killer either. As a quick side note, I want to thank Andy Imatronic for giving me the idea that Purple Guy might be innocent. It helped me rethink the timeline events quite a bit. Okay, so William can be cleared of the MCI, but what about the six victims of the Save Them Massacre? With its six pools of blood and five bodies thrown around like ragdolls, as if the T-800 Arnold Terminator had attacked? It's important to note that serial killers often have a signature, a method of operation they use in their acts. With this in mind, the Save Them killer must have been a different person from the MCI killer, because the MO is entirely different. The MCI was a cunning, stealthy strike in a hidden room, while Save Them was a brazenly careless and brutal daylight smash that caused such a mess that the killer must have wanted it to be discovered. The FNAF 3 tapes say that the Spring Bonnie suit was noticeably moved and was certainly used in at least one major event in FNAF's history. We've eliminated Spring Bonnie's involvement in the MCI since it wasn't a cartoon mascot, which suggests by default that Spring Bonnie was the spray yellow suit Phone Guy mentions being used on Night 6 during the earlier massacre. Phone Guy didn't even know the Save the Massacre happened until Night 6. Purple Guy never reported it, and either ran away or hid once the building went into lockdown, leaving a confused Phone Guy to wonder why the police were cordoning off his dream restaurant. So Henry, Phone Guy, couldn't have been the Save Them killer. And again, Jeremy arrived the week after. It seems like an open and shut case. The massacre happened after Purple Guy's shift, and he didn't report it and ran away when the police arrived. So we finally caught Mr. William Afton red-handed, right? There is only one problem. This. The fun with Plush Trap minigame in FNAF 4 shows us a twisted memory of someone shining a flashlight that stuns animatronics down a dark hallway with two open doorways on either side. Plush Trap, the stand-in for Spring Bonnie, is going in and out of doors, making their way towards the player. A quick look at FNAF 2's minimap shows the very same situation exists in the dark hallway in front of the office, where you shine an animatronic stunning flashlight to keep Foxy and other robots at bay. 
In this minigame, we play as the night guard who actually saw the Save Them Massacre taking place, which means we can only be one person, Purple Guy, and we aren't the one in the suit. Earlier on, I claimed that the origin of all the child animatronic characters could be linked to the kill events at Freddy's, that each kill event had its own unique number of victims, that when you put the victims of Take Cake, Foxy Gogo, -Go, and save them together, you get an apparently complete list of the cast of Freddy's. Those of you with a keen eye have already spotted the error in this list, that more than 12 characters are active by the time of FNAF 2. The list isn't finished. Mangle and the Bear Endoskill have special backstories and need much more time to do them justice. I'll get to them in the next video, but today we're trying to solve the murders, and these two aren't involved. I stand by my claims that the kill events have unique victim numbers, and tell the origin of all the animatronics we see. How, then, can we be missing two? Because we're missing a fourth kill event entirely. Or more accurately, the second one. Two posters in FNAF 1 appear to talk about the MCI. The first poster claims that two children went missing on June 26th and were reportedly lured into the back room. While video surveillance identified the man responsible and led to his capture the following morning, the children themselves were never found and are presumed dead. Police think that the suspect dressed as a company mascot to earn the children's trust. The second poster reports that five children are now linked to the incident at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, where a man dressed as a cartoon mascot lured them into a back room. While the suspect has been charged, the bodies themselves were never found. First, we saw all five NCI children die at the same time during Foxy Gogo. -Go. Why would only two be reported missing first? Did three entire sets of parents forget to check up on their kids even when the police sirens were wailing? Second, while both posters appear to talk about the same incident, they have details that don't match. The first poster from June 26th says the man responsible for the luring was actually identified on camera and that police think that the suspect dressed as a company mascot. But if they had him on camera, wouldn't they know the exact suit he used? A human appears on this video feed, not someone in costume. In contrast, the second poster is absolutely sure that not only was a suit used, but that a cartoon mascot was used. The poster doesn't say the suit in question, but the video feed must show the actual suit if they can pin it down so narrowly to a character that appeared in Fredbear and Friends, eliminating Spring Bonnie. These two posters are not talking about the same event, but two entirely different kill events. The Five Victim poster even mentions how Freddy's is facing an uphill battle to stay open now that two bad incidents have happened. In FNAF 3, Phone Guy mentions the new and improved Freddy's began with two special suits, the first two of Fazbear Entertainment's new weaponized suits, the Golden Suits, Spring Bonnie and Spring Freddy, aka Fredbear. By the time of the MCI, this roster has been expanded to include Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy as well, and no replacements were ready at the time. This means the hidden kill event that actually happened on June 26th, before the MCI, involved two children being stuffed into Spring Bonnie and Fredbear which just happens to fill the two missing slots in our FNAF 2 roster, because the missing characters are Shadow Bonnie and Shadow Freddy. There are lots of ghosts in FNAF, but only two shadows. What makes these two spirits darker than all the others? They're both killers. Let's revisit the MCI and Foxy Gogo. -Go. Phone guy Henry was standing outside. Purple guy William was giving a performance for the kids in his Foxy suit, when suddenly, all five of the kids ended up dead. There probably was another way into that room, the secret room in FNAF 2 also borders the puppet's prize corner, and likely has a secret door to it also. FNAF shows us that the ghost Yellow Bear in FNAF 1 and Shadow Bonnie in FNAF 2 have the power to actually kill the player instead of stuffing them. A ghost using astral projection could have materialized into the room and killed the kids, then disappear without a trace. However, we do have evidence that one of the Golden Suits actually was involved in the MCI. The very existence of Golden Freddy. In the Silver Eyes, Golden Freddy is the ghost of a young boy named Michael, the fifth MCI victim, a personal friend to Charlie and the others as they visit Hurricane Utah to attend his memorial. Michael tries to warn the others of the dangers when they revisit Freddy's, and even tries to save them at one point. Golden Freddy isn't a killer. In FNAF 1-4, through Michael's body mysteriously disappears between Foxy Gogo -Go and Give Gifts Give Life, and isn't around for the puppet to put into a suit, because he's already been stuffed inside the Fredbear suit. In the Color Brothers, I asked how the MCI killer could both wear the Fredbear suit and stuff a kid inside it at the same time, an impossibility since the killer's body would already be filling the suit. But what if a human wasn't controlling Fredbear at the time? What if the empty Fredbear suit was controlling itself and could stuff someone into its own frame? This is how Michael became the second soul to reside in the Fredbear suit. He was consumed by its first occupant, Shadow Freddy, the true killer behind the MCI. At first, it seems like Shadow Freddy may have had involvement in Save Them as well. There are six blood spots, but only five bodies, and we see Shadow Freddy piloting withered Fredbear in the parts and service room, eyes and teeth glowing to signify a human body is present in the suit, eyes and teeth glowing as it slowly consumes the soul that was in the sixth body. 
However, Save Them had a different style than Shadow Freddy's stealthy trickery, and we have evidence that someone else was involved. In Mangle's hidden file, he, she tells us he was here, which immediately eliminates Yellow Bear, because her appearance in FNAF 1 is heralded by the stock sound Laugh Giggle Girl 1 dot wave, which is then slowed down to form all the other deep booming laughs we hear in the background of the first game. While Yellow Bear's appearance in FNAF 1 inspired fans to create the name Golden Freddy, Yellow Bear is a girl, is not Michael, and has no manner of benevolent spirit at all. So Mangle's message eliminates the little ghost girl known as Shadow Freddy as the perpetrator of the Save the Massacre. And since it wasn't Phone Guy, Purple Guy, Jeremy, or Shadow Freddy, you can guess which spirit directed Spring Bonnie to perform the massacre. The Shadow animatronics committed both of the worst massacres at Freddy's, with Yellow Bear slash Shadow Freddy performing the MCI and Shadow Bonnie permitting the Save the Massacre. And both times, they did their best to frame Purple Guy, William Afton, for the deeds. Why? Because we get to see who was behind the June 26 kill event in a memory in FNAF 4. And this time, the Purple Guy was responsible for the deed. I first theorized that Yellow Bear deliberately torments Mike Schmidt FNAF 1 on the assumption that Yellow Bear was Golden Freddy, and Mike slash William had been responsible for the MCI where Golden Freddy was killed. But William didn't kill Golden Freddy. He killed Shadow Freddy and Shadow Bonnie, and they wanted revenge. I'm still piecing together the exact motivations Mr. William Afton had on June 26, 1983. In the Silver Eyes, he forced children to become part of his animatronic family as a twisted way of acquiring love. In Sister Location, the little girl's stuffing was a terrible accident with an animatronic modified from its original purpose, and wasn't truly William's fault. But for the sake of argument, what if in FNAF 1 through 4, the motive was revenge? What if William actually knew that kid that Henry stabbed outside the restaurant? What if they were a member of William's own family, and by extension, Henry Afton's family as well? What if the resentment that Henry would betray his own family just to gain control of the family business William himself had founded ate away at him until he had to take action? Then, ten years later, Henry's new and improved Freddy's opens, and Henry's twin children Sammy and Charlie come to visit, and Purple Guy gladly shows them the new golden suits in the back room. As I said before, many things are reversed in the Silver Eyes. Did Mike kill all? Not with his own hands, but by starting a cascading avalanche of revenge that consumed everything in its path. Henry killed the puppet. William killed Shadow Bonnie and Shadow Freddy out of revenge for Henry killing the puppet. Then Shadow Freddy killed five kids and ate one to get revenge on William, while Shadow Bonnie killed six more to doom the restaurant again when it was reopened. The Silver Eyes tells us the memories of the animatronics are reset each time they shut down. The MCI kids can only remember that an adult killed them, so they attack adult night guards out of vengeance, not even knowing that the Fassbender Entertainment after robotics conglomerate Fear is using the children's anger to power their own sinister plan to harvest the souls of innocent people. William may have returned to the FNAF 1 location after 1993 to smash the animatronics and free the souls of the children in an attempt to end the cycle of violence. But Shadow Freddy, who helped him at first, left him trapped in the secret room as the ghostly children closed in for their revenge, chasing him into Spring Bonnie, where Shadow Bonnie held Purple Guy prisoner for 30 years. And meanwhile, Shadow Freddy, mimicking the voice of Phone Guy, who she devoured during the FNAF 1 Night 4 phone call event, took over the company as the only free afton remaining. She oversaw Chica's Party World, likely the location still open when she announced the ceiling of the secret rooms, setting the stage for Fear's wide-scale operation by the time of Sister Location in the future. But before FNAF 2 closed, she took one more shot at Purple Guy's family. People have asked, who did the Bite of 87 ever since FNAF 1, a puzzle that wasn't solvable until the trailers to FNAF 4 came out. The trailer images are full of hidden 87s and animatronics asking the question, was it me? Was it me? Or was it B? And the answer was waiting for us all the way back at the beginning, where Yellow Bear, Shadow Freddy, speaks her famous catchphrase, It's me. And with all of his family dead or twisted beyond recognition, Purple Guy could well have volunteered for the hot seat in FNAF 1, knowing the dangers, but still trying to be near the only shred of a family he had left, attuned to a place and family that had once been magical. At least, as long as he could hold on, no other innocent guards had to die. William is not a monster, just a man pushed beyond his breaking point by grief and sorrow. 
Facing extraordinary circumstances, he made a rash decision out of a desire for revenge, feeling, somehow, that returning the pain or giving it to others would make things better rather than infinitely worse, a fateful decision that would haunt him for years. Do you wonder why I keep showing Shadow Bonnie with a blue aura? Because just like how Shadow Freddy and Golden Freddy became two Golden Bear ghosts after being stuffed into Fredbear, Purple Guy became the second ghost that resembled the Spring Bonnie suit. The second, Purple, Shadow Bonnie. The victim of June 22nd isn't the one who warps through a lifetime of memories while searching for a way out of a box. This is Purple Guy himself. And the uniquely dark crying child keeping watch over his prison is the first Shadow Bonnie one of the only two kids Purple Guy ever actually killed. What does Purple Guy's spirit do when it finally breaks free and confronts his jailer? He gives him cake. Then the child seems to wake up, freeing Purple Guy in turn and leaving him in control of Springtrap, while Sammy goes on to become the Bonnie of Happiest Day, eventually moving on. It might have been decades later, but it's never too late to right a wrong. And once Purple Guy did gain his freedom, he set off on his second errand returning to the sister location to find, and somehow, against all hope, save his second victim. Shadow Freddy. Ennard. Charlie. While revenge might be the solution to this puzzle, FNAF shows us that it is not the answer. I'm feeling low Need to find a way out I'm missing my home Cause this place is sworn to lock me down I'm losing control I can't end up this way If I go anymore And reach another day We need to see in the dark We need to see in the dark 